Hello and welcome to the Parkinson's Foundation Mind, Mood and Motion program. I'm Melody McLaughlin, Senior Community Program Manager for the New England chapter of the Parkinson's Foundation. I'm thrilled to bring to you New England's very first official community education program. And I must admit, we imagined our first New England program looking a little bit differently than it does. Uh, maybe a room full of eager Rhode Islanders meeting and greeting folks who cross the border to this small but mighty state. Halls adorned with our signature Parkinson's Foundation blue signage, directing you to the buffet tables filled with pastries and all the other things that your neurologist probably told you to stay away from. Uh, nonetheless, you've made it and we're so glad you did. You're not alone and your Parkinson's community is here with you today from near and far. For those of you who are newer to the Parkinson's Foundation, we are the nation's leading community for people with Parkinson's disease, the people who love them, and all of those who are working to end the disease. It's with our presence in communities across the country and the globe that we believe in a promise of a cure and a better life today for those impacted by PD. The urgency of our mission really translates into what we do. To achieve our mission, we pursue three goals, ensuring better care for everyone for today, understanding Parkinson's through research for tomorrow, and educating and empowering Parkinson's community for us all. We provide free resources, including our parkinson.org website, educational book series, webinars, podcasts, our hospital safety kit called Aware and Care, our newly diagnosed kit, and of course our toll-free helpline, 1-800-4PD-INFO, which is staffed by Parkinson specialists. On the research front, we invest more than $10 million annually to study Parkinson's, what causes it, how to treat it, and ultimately how to cure it. I'd like to highlight PD Generation, which is a first of its kind national initiative that offers genetic testing for clinically relevant Parkinson's related genes and genetic counseling at no cost for people with a confirmed diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Participation can be either in person at one of our participating centers of excellence, which includes Mass General Hospital, or from home through a telemedicine appointment in an at-home cheek swab collection kit. To learn more, visit parkinson.org slash PD Generation. So how are we connecting to our communities? Uh, your being here with us today is a prime example of that. It's really through our centers of excellence, our local chapters like ours in New England, volunteers, advocates, and staff across the country that we bring people together to educate and empower those impacted by Parkinson's disease. We also connect with our Parkinson's communities through our nationwide Moving Day events. Since 2011, our Moving Day Walks have raised more than $27 million to support research, our centers of excellence networks, and provide education and resources for people across the country. Your support is even more vital during these times, and we hope you'll be moved to join us virtually at our upcoming Moving Day Boston uh, on Saturday, October 3rd, coming right up. To learn more, please visit movingdayboston.org. <clears throat> And always looking for ways to keep the PD community connected, the Parkinson's Foundation has been providing weekly educational and wellness programs in a virtual format through our PD Health at Home series. Join us at an upcoming Myofitness Monday, a Wellness Wednesday, or maybe a Fitness Friday by visiting parkinson.org slash PD Health. <clears throat> and then of course, last but not least, before we kick today's program off, uh, today was made possible by the support of our sponsors. Today we thank our silver sponsor, Kiowa Kieran, and our bronze sponsors, Accorda Therapeutics, Supernus Pharmaceuticals, Medtronic, and Boston Scientific. Their ongoing support really allows us to offer this unique opportunity to stay connected virtually and to hear from local experts. We invite you to learn about all of our program sponsors by visiting our virtual exhibit hall at parkinson.org slash New England slash chapter dash supporters. It is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the day, Dr. Joseph Friedman. Dr. Friedman graduated Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons and completed a neurology residency at Columbia. Dr. Friedman moved to Rhode Island in 1982. He is currently the director of the Movement Disorders Program at Butler Hospital in Rhode Island, the professor of neurology at the Albert Medical School of Medicine at Brown University, and adjunct professor in the School of Pharmacy at the University of Rhode Island. Wow. <laughs> he served on the editorial board of Movement Disorders and Parkinsonism and Related Disorders, was elected as a fellow of the American Academy of Neurology in the American Neurological Association, 
and elected to membership in the International Association of Parkinsonism and Related Disorders. He also served on the executive committee of the Parkinson Study Group. Dr. Friedman is the author or co-author of several hundred research articles and chapters, as well as several books, including two for patients, Making the Connection Between Brain and Behavior, Coping with Parkinson's Disease, and a new completely free book on the internet or Google Play, Google Play Free Guide to Parkinson's Disease. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Joseph Friedman. Dr. Friedman, you're free to share your screen and take it away. Thank you very much. I hope that you can see my screen. Are my slides being shown? It looks great, Dr. Friedman. Okay, so thank you very, very much for this opportunity to uh, talk to the Parkinson community. It's always a, uh, a pleasure and an honor to uh, speak before Parkinson patients because uh, really you are the true experts having lived with this de disease for a number of years and seen it both from the inside and from the outside. And um, anything I can contribute is, is uh, a terrific reward, uh, especially for myself. So the objectives of this talk, which is gonna be quite short, uh, will be to understand the types of changes that occur uh, typically with Parkinson's. Certainly people don't get them all, but uh, some of them uh, occur in most people. Um, and frequently they are things that people don't think about when they think about Parkinson's disease. So I will be covering several topics, including depression, anxiety, apathy, uh, other mood disturbances, and um, I'll talk about certain strategies for dealing with these types of problems uh, that occur you know, on a day-to-day, -day, uh, a minute-to-minute -minute basis. So this slide, which uh, you will not speed read, except those of you who have uh, really tremendous speed at reading, I just wanna give you an illustration of the types of problems that I see in my office every single day. These are not so unusual. So this is an email I got from the daughter of a patient. I'm writing to inform you of some recent changes in my father's health, both physically and psychologically. He seems to be out of control. He is gambling every day. And yesterday we found out that he has dipped into his retirement funds for more money. He has nothing left. And no matter how many times we tell him and show him that he has no more money left, he doesn't comprehend. So this is a family that was really devastated by the fact that the father, who was a widow uh, and was widower and, and taken care of by his two adult daughters uh, who lived nearby, uh, was at basically sold all, or used all of his retirement in order to gamble. And when I talked to him about it, he minimized it. He said, well, you know, it really wasn't $250,000 that he lost. It was really only $150,000. But the bottom line, of course, was that there was no more money left and that he was telling his relatives that his daughters were, were not giving him any money. So it was a devastating problem. And um, it's something that we recognize regularly today. We didn't uh, a while back as a side effect of medicine. And when I bring up this question to patients uh, at our meetings, anybody who's on a dopamine agonist like Pramipexol, which is Mirapex or Ropinerol, which is Requip or Rotigotine, which is the new pro patch. When I bring this up, they, uh, they chuckle and think, oh, that couldn't happen to me, but it happens. And these sorts of problems often are ignored. So this was another email. I'm a care partner to my husband who was diagnosed with young onset Parkinson's 10 years ago. He's 55 now. We have battled many of the behavioral issues that you talked about, gambling and hypersexuality and other compulsive behaviors and have survived them so far. But it is very helpful, especially to my husband, to hear that this is part of the disease and not a flaw or weakness in his character. In fact, these types of behaviors are really what we call iatrogenic. They're actually the result of medicine side effects. And because people don't assume 
or don't consider side effects other than rashes or you know, itching or diarrhea or constipation as a side effect, that they rarely think about the behavioral problems that we see, especially when these behavioral problems often develop months, sometimes even after a year of being on the medicine. It's not something that begins right away when you start the medicine. And even in those cases where we don't have treatment for these, simply recognizing that the problem is intrinsic to the disease or the treatment of the disease is very helpful for families. It is so devastating for a, a, a spouse, whether male or female, to learn that their partner, uh, you know, maybe having affairs on the side or engaging in, or, you know, pornographic pursuits uh, to learn that this is a medicine side effect that often can be stopped, can cured basically by altering medication. For many, it's so embarrassing that they won't even bring it up and especially wouldn't bring it up when they don't realize that it's tied to the disease. And this brings up a more general type of overview, which I like to think is central to my practice and what should be for all doctors is a quote from Plato. I have no idea which writing of Plato it comes from, so don't ask me. For this is the great error of our day in the treatment of the human body, that physicians separate the soul from the body. So this is written, you know, obviously over 2000 years ago, where he was complaining that doctors just looked at the symptoms and didn't consider the person as a whole being. And of course, we like to think even beyond the person as a whole being, but the family constellation. And so it's very important that the family and the doctor concentrate on the patient and not simply on the tremor, the stiffness, the slowness, all of the difficulties that we see every day and deal with with Parkinson's disease, that there is more to it than just meets the surface. Now, I'm a movement disorder neurologist, and as such, I treat patients with all sorts of movement disorders, not just Parkinson's disease, but Parkinson's disease is defined as a movement disorder, and it's defined by its motor features. We look for tremor, we look for rigidity, we look for slowness of movement, we look for change in posture, uh, change in how people walk, and those are the cardinal features without which we will not diagnose Parkinson's disease. However, there are several non-motor signs and symptoms. That is, symptoms are problems that people complain about, they're aware of. Signs are what we see when we examine the patient, like changes in blood pressure um, or um, changes in memory and things that uh, the patient himself or herself may not be aware of. And the Behavioral problems can be divided into two major groups. Those that affect the body, like changes in your blood pressure, a drop in blood pressure when you stand up, um, changes in GI uh, symptoms, so that constipation, for example, overactive bladder, runny nose, uh, excess sweating, pain, skin changes, and also behavioral. So the non-motor features the features that don't affect motion, motility, are either in the autonomic system, things like blood pressure, sweating, and behavioral. And in study after study throughout the world, not just the United States or Western Europe, but in, in Asia and Africa, the clinical factors that show the highest predictive values for worse health-related quality of life were non-motor symptoms, such as depression, sleep disorders, and fatigue. So although Parkinson's disease is considered a movement disorder, I think more modern thinking on this really would consider it a neurobehavioral disorder because it affects movements and behavior. And long-term, the most devastating consequences of Parkinson's disease are in fact behavioral 
more than motor. And this slide, which you all have to memorize for the test at the end, only joking, um, I divide into two categories here. Those that are intrinsic to the disease, which means they're part of the neurologic changes that occur in the brain as a result of the loss of brain cells in certain areas of the brain, Parkinson patients frequently, not always by any means, but frequently develop one or more of these problems that are in the left column. As a result of treatment of the disease, they may develop one or more of the problems in the second column. In some cases, the problem may be either from the disease itself or iatrogenic, meaning the result of treatment. So let me run through them very quickly because there really isn't enough time to cover them all, even if I had one or two hours. So the one everybody I believe is aware of is depression. Depression is a very common problem in people with Parkinson's disease. And depression occurs as a result of two processes, I believe. One is, I believe that it's intrinsic to the disease, that there are changes that take place in parts of the brain that control your mood, as a result of which you become depressed. It's common for people with Parkinson's disease to have developed depression even before any of their motor symptoms emerge. And that would suggest that it's part of the disease process. But there's also another component, which we call reactive, which is people are depressed because they have this disease and they have uh, a future that is different than what they had anticipated. They might have you know, expected to live the so-called golden years, you know, in retirement, um, doing things that they had put off doing for years and now learn that their future is somewhat uncertain and that makes people depressed. Apathy, that's a very, very under-recognized problem in Parkinson's disease where people lose motivation and they lose interest in things and they often lose pleasure so that they don't enjoy things, they don't look forward to things, they lose interest and they lose a spark in their personality. So they undergo a personality change and it's not depression, it's often mistaken for depression, but is not and is a very common problem. And often when it becomes severe, it's really more of a problem for the family than for the patient because the patient doesn't care. In some ways that insulates the patient from having to deal with the consequences of Parkinson's being unable to do the things that they used to do for pleasure. Anxiety is very common. Something like 30 to 50% of people with Parkinson's disease suffer from anxiety. And uh, they, the type of anxiety, um, you know, is generalized anxiety, but sometimes it's social where people become phobic uh, about interacting with other people, about going outdoors. And sometimes associated with that is a sense of shaking or tremor on the inside of their body where they can actually shake. Fatigue. Fatigue is something that everybody has some, once in a while, some, some people more than others. Um, and I was very impressed by this several years into my career when a patient of mine who had, had Parkinson's for a few years he was about my age at the time. He was working full time and he was doing what seemed to me remarkably well. But he said, you know, what really kills me is the fatigue. I work eight hours a day. and At the end of the day, I can't do anything. I'm just stuck lying on a sofa waiting to go to sleep at night. He doesn't sleep while he's lying on the sofa. He goes to sleep when he goes to bed. But the fatigue the feeling that he just couldn't do anything anymore for work he had always done before was really his central complaint. And it turns out that one third of Parkinson patients, at least in Rhode Island, one third of patients rate fatigue as their single worst, most bothersome symptom. 
and 50% rated among their top three. And this is true around the world. It's not just we have tired people in Rhode Island. This is true for people with Parkinson's everywhere. There are a number of sleep disorders that occur in Parkinson's disease besides the usual problem of getting comfortable, of having a tremor that wakes you up because your hand is shaking on your pillow and making noise, um, overactive bladder so that you have to get up tonight at night to go to the bathroom to urinate. Um, people sometimes act out their dreams in very bizarre ways called REM sleep behavior disorder. There are personality changes that some people think occur in Parkinson's disease. That's not so clear. That's a debated issue. Um, some people become restless. And there's this very peculiar problem that some people have, which is a sense of misperception. They sometimes don't judge distances appropriately. So they may try to sit down in a chair when they're not close enough to the chair to actually sit down. Um, when they talk, some people hear their voice as louder than it really is, so that they talk softer than they should. And of course, since a lot of people with Parkinson's are older, you have the situation where someone talks soft and their spouse is a little bit deaf, and so communication uh, is interfered with, and that's a problem. The iatrogenic problems, probably the most common are hallucinations where people see things and the things that they see usually are not disturbing to them at all. It's disturbing that they're having hallucinations. They don't like the idea that they can't always tell the difference between reality and non-reality, but the hallucinations usually are people and these people don't interact with uh, the person who's seeing them. They usually ignore them as if the person wasn't there. And so a patient will talk to them. There's no answer. There's no response. They don't pay any attention. Sometimes they see children. The most common scenario is persons watching TV, and then they notice there's somebody else in the room watching the TV with them. And they talk to them, and the person ignores them. They go over to the person, and it disappears. And some of the hallucinations are actually enjoyed by the patients. I had a patient recently who told me that he saw these little people that looked like Christmas tree ornaments. And he thought they were delightful, uh, enjoy them. Or a man who told me that he saw this little baby every night and he smiled and said, the baby was so good, he never cried. But the hallucinations can be bothersome. Nobody likes waking up at two in the morning and seeing a man standing at the foot of their bed who is a stranger or seeing people having a party in their bathroom uh, when they have to go. So these can be very bothersome. And more bothersome than that are delusions. Those are false beliefs which tend to be paranoid. And that's probably the worst behavioral problem of all in Parkinson's disease. For a person who feels threatened uh, by you know, a, a belief that their spouse is cheating on them, which is the most common one, or that people are spying on them or stealing from them. And then there are the, um, the compulsive behaviors, which have been associated with dopamine agonist therapy, in which people may gamble, they may become hypersexual, or they may just start doing these very unusual things in a compulsive manner. I've had a patient who was fishing compulsively. I had a man who baked a cherry pie every night, even though he didn't like cherry pies and he didn't eat them. Uh, or a woman who's changed her clothes three times before she went to work uh, and she didn't know why. She had never done this before. Um, and it only started after she got put on the medication. And there are a variety of sleep disorders, some of which are related to medicine like L-DOPA causing very realistic dreams and others that I also have in the intrinsic cause. I will stop there. I could go on and on forever talking in more detail about these, but it's time for Dr. Dupree to give her talk. And so I thank you all for your attention. That was fantastic, Dr. Friedman. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us today and for this wonderful presentation. 
We will see you again soon for the moderated Q&A session at the end of the program. And if you have any questions for Dr. Friedman, please do submit them using the Q&A icon on the black banner of the bottom of your viewing page. I now warmly welcome and invite Dr. Anne-Marie Dupree to share her screen and join us for part two of our Mind, Mood, and Motion program. Dr. Dupree has been a physical therapist for over 35 years with a focus on treatment of individuals with neurological impairments. She received her Bachelor's of Science degree at Simmons College in Physical Therapy and then continued her studies receiving a master's and then a doctorate degree in PT with a specialization in neurology at MGH Institute of Health Professions. She is a board certified as a neurological specialist by the American Board of Physical Therapy Specialists since 1996. Dr. Dupree is a clinical associate professor at the University of Rhode Island Department of Physical Therapy. She has published several peer-reviewed journal articles with a focus on the treatment of individuals with neurological disorders and clinical education of physical therapy students. Again, wow. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dupree. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. Um, I also am very honored to be here and to speak to you about this. It's certainly a passion of mine. Um, been working for over 35 years treating patients with neurological disorders, and I certainly have a huge passion for Parkinson's disease. Um, so I'm more than happy to talk to you about this. Um, so the objectives for this lecture is really to explore more research concerning the effects of physical therapy on exercise, more specifically on mood and cognition for Parkinson's disease, and help you identify some practical strategies to help you in your daily life and, and helping you with dealing with the decline that sometimes happens with patients with Parkinson's disease. Okay, so Dr. Freeman went over these. We all know the cardinal signs for Parkinson's disease, and they're usually how a diagnosis is made. Uh, there's bradykinesia, the resting tremors you see, the rigidity, the postural instability or the balance deficits, and the gait disorders. So these are your frequent motor symptoms that are used for um, providing you the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. And when we treat that in physical, in the treatment is usually physical therapy and some pharmaceutical intervention. And when you get physical therapy for the motor disorders, right, you, most therapists work on any of these six categories. Um, usually it's a combination of them within your therapy program. Uh, they all have a lot of research backing it up, saying how helpful they are and, and dealing with the motor symptoms for Parkinson's disease, right? So we, a lot of you, you when you're going for therapy, will have cardiovascular or fitness as part of your treatment. Always flexibility because of the stiffness you feel. Um, usually some level of flexibility and stretching is included. Um, a strengthening program is very effective in dealing with the symptoms for Parkinson's. Um, and we'll go over it a little more, but it's usually a progressive strengthening program. We always include some balance training. And usually there should be some movement strategy training. Because of the misperceptions you have, and um, it is a movement disorder, most therapy sessions will end combining of all these things to help you figure out how to incorporate your increased strength flexibility into some movement strategy, OK? But Parkinson's is much more than a movement disorder, right? As Dr. Friedman explained, there are a lot of non-motor symptoms for Parkinson's disease. These are the ones that I, in, they're a huge list as Dr. Friedman went over with you, but these are the ones that I found to be the most common with complaints from my patients when they're talking about their non-motor symptoms. I'm talking about this because they are interrelated. As Dr. Friedman said, you could have a urinary issue, urinary frequency, you're not sleeping, and then that in turn can get you feeling depressed or have even a, um, a cognitive decline. Because you're not sleeping, your cognition can decline from it. So it's important that you, when you meet with the physician, when you meet with your therapist, that you explain all your symptoms so that we can help you with that movement strategy issues and how to help you to be to help that quality of life and help you functioning in, in the community. Okay, it has major impacts, right? So all of these disorders, the motor and cognitive, have a huge impact on the individual with Parkinson's disease and on the families themselves. 
right? So the families could have a decline in their health or emotional health and caring, that social connection. They may not be going out and visiting with family or friends as much. It could affect their employment or retirement. And obviously for the individual, I don't need to read all these, but there is a huge um, impact on um, that individual with Parkinson's disease. Okay, so really when we talk about the quality of life for someone with Parkinson's disease, it is a sum of your motor symptoms and your non-motor symptoms. And it's that sum that will help predict your quality of life. So it's important when you meet with your healthcare provider that you talk about both those symptoms in order to get that best outcome in what you're looking for, whether it's with your physician or your therapist. Okay. So we're gonna talk a little about the cognitive functions and most of the studies that you look at for Parkinson's disease, look at the executive function. And I'm defining this underneath. So the various studies that I have listed in, in the presentation talk about, they'll test parts of these. No one can test all the executive functions, but it's about your attentional control, uh, the cognitive inhibitions for you to make good reasoning and problem solving so you can inhibit some thought processes so your reasoning and, and problem solving can be, um, you, you get with better outcomes. Um, they measure cognitive flexibility, your ability to do multiple things at once, um, what your working memory is or any memory deficits they can um, measure. And it, part of your executive function is your language impairment and that speed of processing of your um, cognitive abilities. And again, those very important visual spatial abilities, which you see frequently in Parkinson's disease. And so you have these misperceptions and you misjudge um, when you're trying to walk through a doorway, when you're trying to go sit down. So those visual spatial abilities are also part of your cognitive impairment, a part of cognitive functioning of that part of the brain. So we, we have good news, right? So you may not have an option about what your diagnosis is. You've been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, that's not your choice, you were given that diagnosis, but how you respond to that and how you have every choice in what that coping mechanism is. So you can choose to sit and not do anything, or you can get up, as the picture depicts, and stop moving and try to deal with these coping strategies on, on dealing with Parkinson's disease. Okay, so the issue is you need to take control. And the beauty of this um, is that exercise is, is a great way to start. Exercise not only helps with the motor systems for Parkinson's disease, but it, it helps enhance your brain and it helps, as you'll see later, with mood and with cognition. So exercise, go out there and try to do some exercises will help not only with your motor systems, but with the non-motor systems that you see. So, so it has a powerful effect to exercise. Am I gonna go over it again? Cause I can't stress it enough. It's gonna help with your physical health, all those motor systems we talked about and your me mental health. So did you exercise today? Did you go out? Did you do something to help you? with your disease process. Okay, so we, Dr. Freeman did talk about this, this level of fatigue that individuals with Parkinson's disease and, and they expend 29% less energy than individuals of a similar age. So they fatigue very quickly and this results in them not moving as much, right? So, and, and it results in further decline in some of your motor and non-motor systems associated with Parkinson's disease. So getting up and moving will help with that process. And I know it's hard. I know that feeling of fatigue happens, but you have to figure out what it is you love to do and what it is that's gonna motivate you to try and move a little more each day. Um, so it's important to understand that while we all understand how you feel about your fatigue and your not wanting to get up, especially if you're feeling depressed and, and having some of those other symptoms, the issue is the more you can try to get up and do something, the better it is for your motor and not a motor symptoms for Parkinson's disease. So what's the best kind of exercise? <laughs> The reality is it's what you love to do. Um, I frequently spend time with my patients with Parkinson's 
and I really talk about what it is that you like to do. And for, for those who have me as your patients, you, you see me for your, I'm your therapist. I always ask, do you like to exercise? And I want the honest answer. And if you, and if you don't, I ask what are the things you do through your day? Um, because you got to find something and you got to move. Um, it is a movement disorder, and not only are the, it's going to affect your your motor issues, it's going to affect the non-motor issues. So the best exercise is really the exercise that you would love to do. Um, there is research out there, so if you're someone who likes to exercise and you have many options, these are the ones that have been tested to show not only improve your motor systems, but those non-motor sy sy symptoms of like cognition, mood, um, and depression, okay? They are aerobic exercise, and we're gonna go through these and what some different options can be. Strength training, and this is progressive resistive exercises. That's adding some weights. Um, dance as a movement strategy, okay? Tai Chi and yoga, okay? These last three are more of a movement strategy. They combine lots of issues. They combine flexibility, strength, balance, um, combination of movement, and help with that, um, the symptoms that you're having. Okay, so some of the uh, um, aerobic activities that are helpful, there's lots of um, literature on aerobic activity for Parkinson's disease. And there's more than I, anticipated for the non-motor system. Motor. I usually always look at the ones for motor, and I was quite impressed with all the literature I found uh, for non-motor symptoms for aerobic activity. And there are frequent articles. And cycling was one big one, um, and active cycling. So working on it for 30 to six, 60 minutes is what's recommended of cycling, two to three times a day. Um, obviously, some of the research I'm giving you, they said at least eight weeks. I'm gonna to say to you, you need to find something you love to do and do it as often as you can. Um, it is a lifelong commitment. It's not just for the eight weeks that maybe you enter into a study or you came to PT for eight weeks. It really is something you have to take home with you. You have to own it. You have to believe that this is helping you and you have to continue that process, okay? And so active cycling has helped. There's an article about active interval training. And interval training is, is a new, um, it's not that new, it's been around for what, quite some time. Um, it certainly has caught um, fever, you know, a lot of fever, like a lot of activity in the non-Parkinson's population and now, for, now it started in Parkinson's. Interval training is nice because you work in high intensity for a shorter period of time. So sometimes it's much more pleasant for you to do it because you don't have to do it for 60 minutes. You could shorten your exercise period, but you have to increase the intensity of that exercise period. So if you're going to do um, cycling, you're going to pedal extra hard for 10 minutes in that interval training and then cool down and do a, um, a less moderate. And then you're going to go back and, and do 10 minutes of high intensity and then you can back off. All right, so it's these intervals of training. And so you can get yourself motivated to do, put your timer on and do 10 minutes of high intensity training rather than a prolonged moderate intensity exercise program, you can break it up into pieces. Um, what I found interesting is that passive cycling um, actually improved cognitive function in patients. So these patients were sitting on a bicycle and the, the motor inside the bike was passively um, pumping the legs. Um, and while the study didn't say exactly, it did not improve motor symptoms, all right? It only improved the patient's cognitive um, executive function. And what happened is the belief is that even if it was passive, that there was increase in circulation, increase in circulation into the brain, and that actually it helped with some of the non-motor symptoms, more the cognitive function. These patients were on it for, I think it was an eight week program also, and it was only one time a week. Um, and we're gonna talk more about maybe some other implications as to why that may have been effective. But even as the disease progresses, if you have trouble exercising at a higher intensity, 
then you could try passive cycling as a way of helping you um, improve some of the uh, moods and non-motor symptoms you may be having. So I want to stress with you that if you're going to start with aerobic activity, that you really need to work at a moderate level. It has to be, there has to be some effort put into it. Um, if you want to make changes in your motor system, if you want to see more permanent changes in the non-motor systems, then there has to be a little effort put into the exercise. It can't be a simple, um, almost passive cycling, especially passive cycling, even on a bike with no resistance at all. Um, if you really want to make changes in the motor system and pro more permanent changes in your cognitive function, you really need to put some effort into it, increase your blood circulation, and get some changes happening that are more long-term. Walking is a great aerobic activity. Um, they did, there were many studies using treadmill and walking. Uh, treadmill is easier to, to progress someone, um, so depending what you like to do. Walking just means you have to put the effort into it. So you gotta put a little arm swing in there and put a little pep in your step. That's what I say to most of my patients, come on, I usually get in front, so we gotta put a little pep in your step and get a little more out of you when you're walking. Um, you could do interval training for walking. Walk a little faster for a shorter period of time and then back off and walk um, slower if it helps. Walking with friends, walking is, is extremely helpful. Treadmill helps you push with the rope, with interval training. It can help you get your speed, increase your speed. And obviously there's timing. Uh, you could, there's a clock and you can increase the time that you're walking. Fitbits, I love Fitbits for most of my patients just to help you figure out how much did you do today? How much walking did you, ha did you walk today? Um, did you add steps? Did you add, um, especially now with the Fitbits, you can get heart rates and you can monitor patients. So um, they're a great tool if you want phones. Your phone has um, for free. You don't have to buy a fancy Fitbit for your watch. Carry your phone with you and it will record your steps and, and give you a lot of valuable information about how much aerobic activity did you do today? And we're, was today a slow day? But it helps monitor how you, how you um, your exercise program is going. You really, the recommended um, level of activity is 30 minutes of walking five times a week. And they were saying for at least six weeks to have some functional carryover in your um, non-motor symptoms, mostly here, the executive function, the cognitive functions, and your mood. So when we're talking about aerobic activity, the two walking and treadmill, these are the areas that um, I found in the literature that had the most changes. So your cognition, your thinking, your learning, there was improvements in language, word finding, um, there was improvements in mood, memory, and that executive function, that problem solving ability. Um, and they showed um, a reduction in depression. So increasing that blood flow, working a little harder with your activities can make some nice changes in these um, non-motor symptoms. The other exercises that is found to be helpful uh, for both the motor and non-motor symptoms are progressive resistive exercise training. This is a very famous study. Um, and the reason why it's so famous is it lasted for two years. Um, and there were multiple um, arms to the study itself with um, those control groups and, and there were multiple experimental groups doing exercise training. And the interesting thing is that while only those that did added weights and did a progressive exercise training, only those patients improved in the motor function, those that had a low dose in weight training um, and those that did the high dose added weights on a weekly basis or two weeks, I forget the frequency, they showed um, improvements in cognitive function. So in something as simple as doing low um, weights, not really changing, not doing it all that progressive, actually had changes in the patient's cognitive function. If you're looking for both um, motor and cognitive function, then the then resistance needed to be added and you needed to increase that resistance. Um, I can't stress enough for the motor symptoms that if you want to make a change, your brain has plasticity to it and can make some changes, but you got to stress the brain. Um, it want, you got to want it to want to change. And the only way to do that is to add intensity to your 
exercise program. If you add intensity, then the plasticity in the brain will modify and you'll get more motor symptoms. The nice thing is you don't have to work that hard to help with some of the non-motor symptoms that you may be having. Okay, so you could do low exercises and still get changes in your cognitive function. And then there were studies that looked at both aerobic and progressive exercises. Um, cycling, treadmill, and rowing were some of the um, activities. Most of these were done in interval training. Rowing is a great way, if you like rowing, um, to do interval training. Um, it gives you um, much better results. And you'll see um, later that really a combination of both is probably ideal for many um, of your symptoms that you're experiencing, whether they're cognitive or motor symptoms. And then the other one we're going to go through is the movement strategies. Um, I always try to end my session with some movement strategy. I think most PTs do. Um, and there were several studies on this with Tango specifically. Um, I only tried to look at randomized control studies, which shows, which is a higher level of evidence. Um, and the nice thing about the tango, it also showed improvements in those visual spatial functions. So your ability to, and they, the partner was, um, for this study, the partner had, was non-Parkinson's. Um, and if you notice, because of those misperceptions, a lot of PTs will, will work in front of you and have you mimic the movement. And it helps with some of that perceptual thing. So holding, grabbing someone and dancing with them will help them figure out how to move or step. Um, I know I've gone over it with, with many of my patients. If you're freezing, sometimes grabbing their hand, holding their hand, you taking the step, that allows them to figure out that they need to, if they're freezing, that they need to take the step and move forward. So that relationship um, between um, someone with non-Parkinson's and Parkinson's is very helpful for that visual spatial function. Um, tai Chi um, and yoga have been shown to help with um, the um, motor symptoms as well as the non-motor symptoms. And then those multi multimodal, which I like to think what PT is all about, um, helps with those cognitive functions. And we went through this, the flexibility, the resistive training, the balance, the, uh, the cardiovascular exercises, um, all of these will help improve your motor as well as your non-motor symptoms. So I can't also some of these studies did not control for the social effect. So if you're doing a dance class, if you're doing yoga, um, tai chi, and many of these studies with the cycling and the walking programs were done in groups. So it's very hard to know um, what was due to a social effect in helping with your mood, helping with your cognitive status, and what had to do with exercise. There were only I believe, I'm trying to remember now, two studies that really controlled for the social effects. Um, in either case, socializing improved cognition. Socializing improved um, your mood. Um, so certainly that control group that exercised and socialized had the greatest outcomes and improvements, especially in quality of life. Um, when there was a, a socialization part of the exercise. And I understand this is hard with COVID. I have many patients that I've been starting to see again in therapy and I've seen a decline. And I think some of that had to do with that lack of socialization. I know it's not the same doing something on the computer or Zoom, um, a class along those lines or being on the ADA support groups during Zoom. Um, but it's better than no contact at all. Um, so as much as you're, you may feel isolated, I strongly suggest that you still um, log in, whether it's remote, um, in order to get some of that socialization, so that, that talking amongst each other, because it does have an effect on your cognitive ability and your mood and your quality of life. Um, so whatever little that you can do, or as much as you can do, you should try as much as you can. And I know it's difficult. So what are the recommendations for how much exercise should you really be doing? Um, they're saying that it should be aerobic, resistive, or multimodal. Um, two to three sessions per week 
So duration is, is, is why start small, add as you're going along. The key is it needs to be a moderate intensity. So your target heart rate, there are, there are apps out there to help you with that. Sometimes I just say to my patient, how hard did you work on a scale from one to 10? If they say anywhere between a six and an eight, then I think they're between their target heart rate of 60 to 80%. And the reality is the duration, it needs to continue. Um, it, it ranged from all this, the systematic reviews we looked at. Okay. And last, these recommendations that I just went over with you are no different than what the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, recommend for older adults. How much activity should you be doing? Even if you don't have Parkinson's, it's a moderate intensity of aerobic activity. You should be doing 150 minutes per week, and you should include a strengthening program at least two times a week. For the older adults, they also recommend the balance piece. So this is really not different. It's not, it's not all that different from what the CDC is recommending for anyone who's older with or without Parkinson's disease. So my last slide, just think, there's a non-pharmaceutical intervention that will improve and protect against your mood impairments while improving your cognition, your language, and your motor function. And that is exercise. Find what you love. That's my best advice to you and do it. It's, there's no secret recipe on what exercise is best. You just have to consistently do it. Thank you. Great, thank you Dr. Dupree for sharing this great information with us and for your wonderful presentation. I'd like to welcome Dr. Friedman back with us to join for the moderated Q&A session. We received some really great questions so far during your presentation, so we'll take some time to address those now. And for anyone else out there, I, I don't know Rhode Island is to be so shy, please submit your questions uh, using the Q&A icon on the bottom black banner of your screen. Can I say something? Please. I would like to underscore the importance of exercise. Oh. What I tell my patients is that when they take their medications for Parkinson's, it helps them today while they're taking their medications, but it doesn't help them in the future. And exercise is an investment in their future. They wanna be walking and mobile five years, 10 years, 15 years down the road. And taking the medicine today, which most patients are very, very compliant about, uh, you know, helps them now, but it really isn't gonna influence very much how well they're gonna be walking 10 or 15 years from now. And walking is an investment so that it maximizes your ability to be able to do that in the future. And you can't make up for it. Every day missed is a day that you don't get back. So exercise really has to be part of your daily plans, like a religious ritual, like taking your medicine. So I just wanna underscore how important I find that. And uh, my patients know that because I ask them uh, every visit, you know, whether they've been exercising and try to encourage them. And in fact, I tell my families that the spouse or family can nag a patient only about two issues. One is anything related to safety and the other is exercise. Great, thank you, Dr. Friedman. So let's see here. Our first question is actually for you, Dr. Friedman. <clears throat> Excuse me. My spouse is five years since diagnosis and has recently developed somewhat of a compulsive habit of humming or steadily making little sounds. Might this be related to her being on a dopamine agonist? It is not constant, but it is still distracting. Yeah, that is, that's an interesting question. And actually, I, I, have to, I actually published a case report about that um, you know, a few decades ago. There are people with basal ganglia disorders, Parkinson's being one of them, but other disorders that affect uh, the, a structure within the brain that produces a certain type of movement disorder where people make sounds. And that probably is not related to medication. It could be if it started within a year or so of starting a dopamine agonist like Pramipexil, which is Mirapex, or Pinerol, which is Requip, or Rotigotine, which is the new Propatch. If it started within a year or so of that, it well may be related. But if, it, if not, 
I would say it's part of the disease and there's really nothing you can do about it, but try your best to tune out. Great, thank you. And this next question is for Dr. Dupree. Dr. Dupree, it takes a lot of convincing to get my spouse to exercise. When she does it, she seems so much better. How can I help make the motivation to exercise come a little easier for her? Um, number one, find something she likes to do. And number two, do it with her. Um, doing it as a group, finding someone who wants to exercise with her, walk with her. Um, if you do the exercises with her, she'll be more likely to continue and do it. So do it as a uh, together. Um, it's helpful for everyone to be moving and getting around. So those are my suggestions. Find something she loves to do and hopefully you like it also and try and do it as often as you can. Tasers also work. If you want to do anything, you can do more. I haven't learned that one yet. Tasers, I'm going to have to remember that. That statement not endorsed by Parkinson's Foundation, but still funny. <laughs> Our next question is for uh, both of you, Dr. Friedman, if you'd like to answer first. I, I experience a degree of fatigue almost daily, as if I need a, a nap in the afternoon. I miss having energy. What are some strategies or solutions? Well, first of all, there's a difference between fatigue, which is tiredness, um, a physical sort of tiredness, not having the energy or motivation to do anything, and sleepiness. So a fatigued person is a person who, which everybody feels fatigued. You know, if you ran a marathon or you walked a long distance, did a lot of exercise, you feel fatigued and you will rest after the exercise, but you won't fall asleep. So if you're falling asleep frequently, then you have sleepiness. Now, fatigue and sleepiness often overlap and it can be hard to separate the two. But if you're sleeping excessively during the day, then you need to look at your sleeping at night to make sure you're sleeping well at night. You could have things unrelated to Parkinson's disease like sleep apnea, um, and it could be related to your medicine. If you're truly fatigued, that is you lack energy to do things, but you're not sleeping, you're sitting because you can't do anything else. You can't muster the energy, but you're not needing a nap. That is very difficult to treat. And really there are no studies indicating how we should treat it. I think most of us in the field encourage people to exercise on a regular basis and to try to very gradually increase their endurance. So, you know, if walking 10 minutes is too much, you walk five and then you try to get to six or seven and so on. And sometimes I use medications, although they haven't been proven to work. I use stimulant medications, but you have to be careful about using them. And I believe a lot of doctors are probably quite reluctant to use them, but I, personally think that they work in some people, um, but there's no guideline on, on treating fatigue. Yeah, I, I agree about the exercise. You have to start small. You can't, if you do too much too soon, it'll fatigue you because of the exercise and you further not want to do much. So if you start small, um, you know, park the car a little further away from where you're going, take the few extra steps to get into where you're going. Um, trying to get them out. Um, yeah, I, sometimes once you get too comfortable and you're sitting in your favorite chair, it, it may be too late. So <laughs> try to prolong that time when you want to sit in your favorite chair and you're ready to um, relax. Try to push that time out. That's usually what I try to say to them. I understand that favorite chair. I get it. It's the end of the day. You want to rest and you deserve it. Um, but try to push that time out so you can do more and more each day. One of the interesting things about fatigue um, that we often don't keep in mind is that there's a difference between fatigue, that is you feel tired all the time, and fatigability, that is you don't feel tired until you start to exercise and you find that you fatigue much more easily than you used to fatigue. So that's fatigability. And fatigability you can improve upon with this endurance training with the slow uh, increases. For if you feel fatigued all the time, you just don't have the energy. One of the interesting things about Parkinson fatigue is that those people often say that once they start to exercise, they get their energy back. And so it's really very difficult for them to overcome the inertia that they feel in order to get moving. But once they get moving, they're actually pretty good at doing this stuff. Uh, so there's a kind of mind body disconnect um, 
that they just have to learn to try to surmount. But it's not an easy problem to get over. There's no easy fix for this, and every patient is different. So right. stop to be consistent, though. You can't do it once and then not go back. It's got to be little increments and consistent. Yeah, you've got to push yourself, absolutely. Yes. Consistency is certainly key. And I'm looking at the clock here, and I believe this Q&A session um, has concluded our presentation. I want to thank our fantastic speakers, Dr. Freeman and Dr. Dupree, and especially all of you for joining us today. If your question wasn't answered, we had a lot of great questions here. I encourage you to contact our helpline at 1-800-4PD-INFO, where a Parkinson's specialist would be more than happy to hear from you. For more information about our resources, our upcoming virtual events, visit our website at parkinson.org, or for a local touch, visit parkinson.org slash New England. This program was recorded and will soon be archived on our YouTube channel at parkinson.org slash YouTube. And another round of applause and thank you to today's sponsors, our silver sponsor, Kiowa Kieran, and our bronze sponsors, Accorda Therapeutics, Supernus Pharmaceuticals, Medtronic, and Boston Scientific. Last but not least, we hope you'll come back soon. Our next virtual New England program is Let's Talk About It, Symptoms Beneath the Surface with speaker Dr. Anas Hanoon of Dartmouth Hitchcock Health in Dartmouth College. You can learn more and register at parkinson.org slash New Hampshire. And then next up in our PD Health at Home world on Wednesday, September 30th is PD Generation. What have we learned so far with speaker Dr. Roy Alcalay of Columbia University. For something new and fun, join us in October for some abstract art in Parkinson's disease, sing out loud with Parkinson's disease, what's your Parkinson's story, and Shakespeare for Parkinson's. For a complete lineup of our PD Health at Home programs, visit parkinson.org slash PD Health. Again, thank you to our fantastic speakers. We so appreciate your joining us for our very first New England program. It wouldn't have been possible without you. And that just about wraps us up, folks. You'll receive a short survey. We hope you'll take it. Um, we want to know what you thought. We want to know if there's other topics you'd like to learn about in New England. And thank you for joining us from New England and beyond. Stay well and come back soon. Bye, everyone.